It's not quite cooled down fast enough, so I'm going to hang on to this guy just a little longer. Well, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Uh, we are in a, in a journey through the book of Acts. Uh, this is what we do here as a church. We walk through Scripture, uh, books of the Bible, verse by verse. And, uh, and what we do Sunday morning is pretty simple. We want to read the text, we want to explore the text, and we want to apply the text. Uh, we simply want to know what does God's Word say, what does it mean by what it says, and then how do we apply it to our, to our lives. And so, uh, and so as you're turning, Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25, let me just give you kind of a little bit of a recap uh, of, of uh, where we were uh, last week. We know that the church scattered. We talked last week that God intends his people to be a scattering people and a preaching people. And, uh, and so Luke focuses as they scatter from Jerusalem uh, in Acts because they started in Jerusalem waiting for the Spirit. They got the Spirit. Uh, and then the church began to grow in Jerusalem. Persecution happened. Uh, God uses that persecution to scatter the church abroad. Luke focuses on Samaria. Samaria. Why do they go to Samaria? Well, they're, they're half-breed heretics. The Jews hate them. And it's showing that there's no, there's no boundaries that the gospel will not cross, that we are to go to all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And, it, and it's focusing, Luke is focusing here on this guy, Philip, who is a deacon. He's not an apostle. He's a deacon, uh, was appointed with, with Stephen. And so what's going to happen here in the rest of chapter 8 is you're going to see Luke contrast two characters. He, you're going to see Simon the magician, which we're going to look at today. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at the Ethiopian eunuch. And so you have the Ethiopian eunuch and his faith story uh, and his believing. And then you have uh, Simon the magician in his story. And so today, we're going to start in verse 9. We're going to look at Simon uh, the magician it says, but there was a man named Simon. So Philip's here. He's in Samaria. There's a man named Simon. Uh, and he, he had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. So you got this guy, Simon, who practices magic in Samaria. He's done this for a long time. He wows the people with his, uh, with his magic or with his sorcery, his black magic, whatever you want to call it. It's not of God. It's not of God. But it so captivates the people that it demands their attention. So they listen to him. They receive his teaching because they see this demonstration of his, of his power. Now, if you note the similarity of how also the gospel spreads in the same kind of way, you have, you have miracles that are validating a message. And so you see the, the apostles, uh, mostly the apostles, um, in a couple of instances, you'll see the, um, like Philip here, as, uh, they'll do miracles, signs, and wonders. And accompanying that comes this profession of the gospel, Jesus Christ as God. And so here what you have is you have signs, you have miracles, you have magic. And yet it's pointing to a false truth, a false gospel, a false message. And what did these signs point to? Well, they pointed back to Simon. They pointed back to Simon. This guy is a total egomaniac. Like it's like he does these wonders. He's like, hey, look at me. He's pointing it all back to himself. He was referred to as the power of God that is called great or the great power of God. Of God. In other words, he's kind of, he's projecting this God-likeness in his character uh, or type of manifest version of God, almost a little bit uh, like what you see in, in Jesus, except obviously a false version. And so for a long time, it says for a long time, the people, they followed him and they listened to him. Verse 12, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So Philip shows up and he starts performing his own, so his own signs by the power of the Spirit. And then he takes those signs and he preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And the people are being won over. They're being won over from, uh, uh, from Simon to Jesus. 
says that as he's preaching, what they're doing is they're believing, and then they're being baptized. And so what you see here, as we've seen throughout the expansion of the church, is that when people believe, they get baptized. And that sign of baptism here, in this case, is saying, I'm not following Simon the magician anymore. I'm following Jesus. I'm taking on the sign of Jesus Christ. I'm his follower. I'm his disciple. I'm becoming a part of his people. So here, baptism is this, baptism is this public demonstration of a change of loyalty. They're no longer following Simon. It says, even, verse 13, Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. It says, even Simon believed. And did Simon believe? This is debated. I'm not convinced. And we'll walk through the text of why I think that Simon's belief is bogus. That Simon is a bogus believer. Uh, two d- details to recognize up, up to this point. First of all is just the detail of baptism. Everybody who believes, whether true or false, they get baptized. And you'll see this, the same thing with the Ethiopian eunuch. Believers, followers of Jesus Christ, as a part of our declaration of following Jesus, baptism, baptism is a sign of that. It is a command of Jesus as he tells the disciples, go into all the world, make, make disciples and baptizing them. It's not optional for Christians. We get baptized. And by the way, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll actually have an opportunity, a baptism class. For, so for those of you that are interested in taking that next step in baptism, uh, we want to create healthy on-ramps for you. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have not been baptized, I want to encourage you to, uh, to come and participate in, in that class. The second thing is this. Notice Luke's use uh, so far through this, these texts of this word amazed. Amazed. I think what I think Luke is trying to give some insight here because uh, it's used three times in like four verses or five verses. In verse nine, it says Simon amazed the people of Samaria. Verse eleven it says for a long time he amazed them with his magic, and then verse thirteen. Now he's following Philip, and he's being amazed by Philip and the signs that are being done there. So I think. Part of what we're seeing here, and it'll flesh out a little bit more later on, is that Simon is addicted to amazement. He loves to amaze people, and he loves to be amazed. It's a big clue for what happens. Verses 14 through 17 says, Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard uh, that Samaria uh, had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, and they came down uh, and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So next week, we're going to actually, we're going we're gonna to talk about that section next week. Raise a lot of questions, important questions that we should answer about the receiving of the Spirit and, and wh- why does he fall and, and making sense of all that. But for today, we just need to recognize the Spirit fell, the Spirit fell, and, uh, and then the focus goes back to Simon. It says, now when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon saw this working of the spirit, so it shows us that the spirit falls in a very potent, tangible way. It doesn't tell us exactly how. My assumption is maybe kind of like at Pentecost, uh, but in, in some way that is, that is very obvious. And so this power, Simon sees, comes through the, through the apostles' hands, at least based on his perception and understanding of it. And so Simon, loving amazement, was like, oh, wow, I need to be able to do that. I need to be able to do that. And he offers them money. He offers them money to receive this power so that he can do the same thing. So remember, Simon's profession was was a magician, was wowing people. And so this is an investment opportunity, it seems. I'm going to pay I'm going to pay these guys to get this amazing power. It's so amazing that even he's amazed by it. And he expects a great return on investment for purchasing this power. I want you to notice something. Uh, First, it doesn't seem 
that Simon is actually experiencing this move of the Spirit in the same way everybody else is. It says he's, he saw the move of the Spirit. Now, I might be reading into that a little bit, but maybe not. It seems like, uh, especially in fact that I think that he's not converted, that he's not experiencing the Spirit in the same way. I think he's seeing it done. He wants to pay and have the power. And the second is this, that he has zero acknowledgement, zero acknowledgement of God with regards to this power. He said, like, it's a business transaction. You got the power, and I'm going to, I want you to give it to me, so I'm going to pay you money to give me this power. Whatever you're doing, whatever, whatever you got going on, to do that through the laying on of your hands. I want that. And I think what we're seeing is that time is telling the story of Simon. His heart is being revealed over, over time. And so Peter, Peter's here now because Peter and John had come. So Peter now responds to him. And he said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. So Peter, first of all, rightly acknowledges this is not a gift from us. This is a gift from God. So it's not ours to give, first of all. So even if we wanted to, to take your, your money, we couldn't. We couldn't give you this gift. It's a gift of God. So they, they rightly attribute where this power is, is coming from. And what Peter is basically telling him is to take his money and go to hell. That's essentially what Peter is telling him here. You're like, man, it seems kind of harsh, right? Tell him to like, take your money and go to hell. But for a man seeking to buy and manipulate the power of God, for his own earthly gain and his own earthly glory and lead people astray away from the one who came to, like, hell is exactly where he belongs. And by the way, the same is true for all who seek to use their religious and spiritual authority and platform for their own prosperity and their own gain and their own power to deceive the weak and the vulnerable, the very ones that Jesus came to save. God will not tolerate it. And yet, and yet, God is so unthinkably merciful that he offers forgiveness even to those people. At no point in this text do we see that Simon can't be saved. I think what we're seeing is that he can, in fact, be saved, and yet he's so consumed with his desire for power and money, his own greatness, that he remains unwilling we learn a major lesson here from Simon as we head into the final verses of, of our text. We learn that Simon's belief in Jesus, remember he, was, he believed and was baptized? It was bogus. It was not real. Simon's belief was bogus, which means then there is such thing as bogus believers. There is such thing as those who will walk with Philip and the apostles, sit at the table with Jesus, and not know God. That's what we learn here. So Simon believed, seems in his mind, in Jesus. He, he declared with his mouth, apparently, the right profession because they baptized him which was the third thing he did. He demonstrated this belief by publicly being baptized, and then he starts to walk with Philip. But his belief was unaccompanied by an essential element of every true believer. We see this in the following verses, 21 through 22. Peter says, You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, 
of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness, which is a, it's a reference from Deuteronomy 29, 18. And in the bond of iniquity, in the bond of sin. In all of his belief, it seems that Simon never repented in his heart. His mind knew the right thing. His mouth said the right thing. His actions demonstrated the right thing. And yet, there was an unrepentant, hardened heart still consumed by sin lingering within. James tells us that there is a belief that is unsaving. James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. There is a belief in God, a belief in Jesus that is not saving. You can have right knowledge about God, right doctrine. You can exegete the texts perfectly, come to the right conclusions And yet still at the core of your heart, be hardened towards God, unrepentant of your sins. Paul tells us that there is a belief that is in vain, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless... You believed in vain. There is a people who will believe, who will believe and who will walk with the church and who will fall away. And they will have believed, like we saw with Simon, in vain. It wasn't real. Jesus tells us this, right? The parable of the four soils. So you have have one seed, you have four uh, seeds scattered on four different kinds of soil. First seed doesn't sprout because it's rocky, there's no soil. The two middle seeds, they actually both sprout. One sprouts and is scorched by the sun, withers, sprouts quickly, dies quickly. Then there's another one that sprouts but is eventually choked out, kind of in time by the thorns, by the weeds. And then there's one seed that is planted in good soil and perseveres to the end, grows. So think about that. Two-thirds of the seeds that actually sprouted eventually die away. Jesus tells us that bogus believers will live among the true believers. Matthew 13, he says, he put a a parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the men were sleeping, his enemy came and he sowed uh, weeds among the wheat. And he went away. So when the plants came up and they bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. Verse 30 says, let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in a bundle to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Are you catching the drift? There's a serious warning in the text that we're looking at today. There's a serious warning that we need to see as the church. And by the way, the, 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 our solution is not for us to try to like investigate and find the bogus believers so that we can excommunicate them. Like that's not, that's not the, uh, the application here. Because what you essentially have is three categories of people. You have the true believer, you have the unbeliever, and then you have the make-believer. Right? So, I mean, really, it's two categories. There's believer and unbeliever. But you have this kind of weird pseudo-believer, this, this one that's there, that's sitting among them, that is saying the right things, that's walking, doing the right things, that's serving, that's giving. And yet, their heart has not been penetrated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of these make-believers are aware, since the enemy came and sowed, sowed the seed. Matthew 7, Jesus calls that there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. There's going to be people within the church, within God's people, that seek to wreak havoc on the work that God is doing. But unfortunately, I actually think that most 
most are actually are, are unaware. They're unaware that their heart, that their belief is bogus, that their faith that they have is not a true saving faith. And they're going to, I think, experience like what it says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Jesus says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is my fear. My fear is that there will be so many, maybe in this room, many in this room even, will find themselves standing before God one day, overwhelmed by the perfection, the, in, the intense glory and holiness, facing judgment for your life and be found unknown by Jesus, uncovered by his blood, unforgiven of your sins. Okay, so what, what do we do? We see Simon's bogus believer. What do we do then in, in light of this? We test ourselves. So, that, so what we don't do is try to, try to identify the bogus believers, seize them, put them out. It's for each one. The call is for each one to test yourself. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3.15, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Well, what's the test? I just want to focus today on one, one element. When you believed in Jesus, was it accompanied with an overwhelming sense of guilt and shame and unholiness and disgust because of your sin and unrighteousness and at the same time followed by an intense uh, understanding of freedom and joy and forgiveness and hope and all of these things in Christ causing you to causing you to See this thing that separates you from God. See that Christ has forgiven you and freed you from those things so that now you can pursue your relationship with God. It's like someone gives you a 100-pound weight and says, all right, I want you to take this weight the entire distance of the Appalachian Trail barefoot. And then that person turns around and says, jump on my back because I'm going to carry you the whole way. God sees, God desires that we see. We must see the weight of our sin as we stand before a holy and righteous and perfect God. We have to understand that our sin will rightfully be judged by this just God. All will be found guilty. And the consequence, Scripture tells us, is an eternity separated from God in a place called hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then God says, but because I love you, because I, because I love you and I desire mercy over judgment, I'm going to send my son carry to carry the guilt and the shame and the conviction of your sin if you would repent and believe in Jesus if you look through the new testament repentance repentance is often accompanied with this idea of belief repent and believe read through the gospels 
turn from your sins. So this idea of repentance is a, it's, it's turning away. It's acknowledging, agreeing with God of our sinfulness, and it's turning away from that and believing that the forgiveness comes not through our turning away. The forgiveness comes through what Jesus did on the cross. If this is not the foundation of your faith, your sinfulness, God's holiness, restoration in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of that sin, your belief is bogus. If your belief in the gospel is based on anything else, then it is not true belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about Jeremiah 29, 11, that God's got some amazing plan for your life if you just follow Jesus. That's not the focus. It's not Philippians 4.13 that you can do all things with Christ who gives you strength, so follow Jesus so that you can accomplish all the things that you want. That is not the focus. Now, there are truths for believers within those passages, but that is not the essence of our Christianity. It is not the essence of our pursuing Jesus. It is Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You were dead in your sins, and in Christ you were made alive. That's the focus of true belief. It's about being restored to relationship with God, with your creator. That is the focus. And ultimately, ultimately, it's not about you. It is about the glory of God. God makes his own greatness in his own glory known by putting his mercy and his justice and his love and his compassion on display by forgiving sinners who absolutely do not deserve to be forgiven. So we should test ourselves. And by the way, parents, this is because of this reality of bogus believers. So we got baptism class coming up. So for adults and teenagers, we're going to send you into a class and we're going we're to help take you next step. But when it comes to your children, this is why as a church we're very slow to baptize children. Because we need to make sure that the profession of their faith is not just that they have the right knowledge, they're saying the right words, they're doing the right demonstration, but that to the best of our knowledge that we can see that there is repentance in their heart. That the Spirit of God comes, uh, uh, lives with inside the believers. And one of the primary works of the Spirit is conviction of unrighteousness. And so if you want your kid to be baptized, I'm going to ask you, or Pastor Sabine is going to ask you, are you seeing demonstrations of a broken heart because of sin in your child? If not, wait on baptism. So as we wrap up, to all the worship team, you guys can come back. Listen, we, we have to take this text as a warning for us as the church. That there is a belief in God that is bogus. And we don't like that in our inclusive culture. It's like everybody can just be in, right? Why are some in and why are some out? But this is just what scripture teaches us. So we don't just dismiss it because we maybe don't like it. And so my aim in this is, what I'm calling you to do today, all of us, I've been doing this all week. It's been actually kind of brutal. We you ask yourself, like, am I truly in the faith? Like when you lay in bed at night and you think about your life and you think about your choices and you think about your sin, what is the disposition in your heart in that moment when no one else is seeing you? That's the place where it will be revealed the most. Because there are going to be people who serve faithfully and who give faithfully and who preach and who teach and who do all of these awesome things. And yet their heart internally is hardened to the gospel of Jesus. There's been no repentance of their sin. They were unwilling to let go of things in pursuit of God. So if you say you have a new relationship with God, but you do not have a new relationship with sin, you are deceived. You are deceived. And so as the worship team begins to play, this is kind of how we, we kind of do this. We, we walk through text and we want to we dissect it and understand what's going on. But then at the end, the worship team is actually going to take about a minute, a minute, two minutes to just kind of play. And this is a time of reflection and response. So as we think about the text, what is God, through his word, uh, impressing on your heart by the Holy Spirit? 
Like take this moment and maybe really assess your heart. Like is your belief bogus? Test yourselves. And this isn't a call to like always question whether or not like God can save you or you're forgiven of your sins. It's different than that. It's like, is your heart broken because of the sin that you have in your life that separates you from God? And if not, call out to God to that end. Like if you're concerned about it, like my concern is for the person who sits in the room and doesn't actually think about this stuff. Not the one who approaches God with a contrite heart, wondering, God, I just like, I wanna make sure that my heart is right with you. It's the one that dismisses it altogether. That's the person I'm concerned about. So in this time, just think about this. Think about Simon. There is this element of his life where he walked with, with the church, only that his heart is to be revealed over time. And he's given a rebuke, and he's actually called to repentance. And his response is actually kind of sad because his response isn't a response where he goes to God. He tells the apostles, you pray for me in these things to your God. He doesn't actually go to God himself at any point in this text. So I'll call you to go to God today in this moment. And I, I hope for, for, this, for this room what we find is we, we approach God and we, we test ourselves and we pray and we find a, a, a deep conviction of sin and a sweet Savior on the other end, just like we did when we first believed. And for those maybe here, maybe for the first time, you might find, hey, I've actually never really felt bad for my sin. Just kind of followed Jesus for various reasons or never followed Jesus before. In this moment, know that God is calling out to you. You're giving, uh, given an opportunity to recognize that you are separate from God because of your sins. Those sins will one day be judged by God Almighty. You will be found guilty and you will find yourself separated from God for eternity in a place God ha called hell. And the good news is that God does not desire that for you. It must happen because he is just. He can't just bypass it. Which is why Jesus matters so much. Because God takes this punishment on himself. If you would repent of your sins Believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and begin your new life following him. Assess yourself today. What is the foundation of your belief? And at the end of the service here, we're going to have a prayer team come. The worship team will, will begin to play. And we'll have a prayer team come forward and they'll be down here. And if at any point during the song or at the end of the service, you want to come talk, you, wanna, you want us to help you take those next step in your faith, um, like let us do that. Let us do that. Respond to the gospel. Let God do a work in your heart. Pray. Father, it is kind of concerning there, that there are those among us who may be deceived into thinking that they are believers, and yet they are not. And it's not a hardness towards them as much as it is a sadness because of the deception. Forgiveness of our sin and restoration to you is, is an amazing thing. And just like you, we desire that all would come to repentance. And so I pray today, God, in this room, every person here, we would, we would stop and we would search the depths of our heart and we would we would really ask, how do I feel about my sin towards God? And that if we find that we are kind of hardened to that or we're holding on to things, that, Lord, that we would just press into you and ask you to help us and that you're, by your spirit, you would come and you would move and you would help move us into the direction of, rest, of being restored to you through Jesus Christ. There is nobody in this room that cannot be forgiven if they would repent of their sins and believe on Jesus. It is an all-inclusive offer. And so I pray this morning that for the believer, we would search and we would test and we would find ourselves uh, still under your amazing grace, forgiven of all of our sins. And for those that uh, are not believers, that would find that there is true hope and eternal life in Jesus Christ, that you would bring conviction on their heart. By your word. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name.
Amen.